Hi, uh, I'm Art Bergeron, and welcome back to the series of uh, seminars that I'm doing uh, regarding elder law issues, talking about my friends Frank and Mary. Uh, if you've been to one of my presentations at the Senior Center or the library in the area, you know that um, Frank and Mary's goal in life is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. They're just trying to take care of each other. They've got three kids. They want to make sure that following their death, their kids inherit whatever they can, whatever they have left. These are the kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. I always joke that um, if you are old enough to get that joke, you're old enough to be my client. Um, so the goal of all of these presentations is really to just help um, uh, Frank and Mary figure out uh, the best way to deal with the rest of their lives uh, and the best way to structure their assets so that at the end of their lives, um, their children end up getting it, getting the assets and not someone else. I always tell people, you know, one of my goals in estate planning is to figure out the strategy through which you get the assets to, your, to, your, to your, whoever you want them to go to and to make sure that you cut out other people. Uh, I've never had a person who told me that they really want to leave some money at their death, for example, to the IRS or to the Department of Revenue because they've just done such a great job. So typically folks want to structure things so as to make sure that assets don't leak away. So that's really, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the, the point of this presentation because, and by the way, this is um, Frank and Mary's asset picture. They own a home worth $400,000. Frank has an IRA worth $200,000. They have joint savings of $200,000 um, for a total assets of uh, $800,000. Frank has a social security check coming in every month of $2,000. Mary's check is half of Frank's or $1,000 a month. They're also earning some money from um, their savings account and from the IRA, but we're not, we're not factoring that in here for purposes of this presentation. Uh, <clears throat> the point of this presentation, though, is to talk about um, probably Frank and Mary's greatest fear um, while they're alive, um, which is what happens if one of them needs nursing home care. Um, as you know, they've got substantial assets and therefore they're probably going to be fine until they die unless they need nursing home care. The major reason for that is Medicare. Uh, Medicare was designed in order to make sure that if Frank or Mary got sick, they wouldn't go bankrupt as a result of getting sick. There's, I remember reading this incredible statistic about Medicare that in 1960, uh, something like 33% of all elderly households um, were poor. Um, as of last year, that number was six or seven percent. And the major reason was this, was Medicare. Because Medicare takes care of you if you're sick in a whole number of ways. It just doesn't take care of you if you need a long stay in a nursing home, if you have cancer, if you need chemo, if you need transplants, if any number of things Medicare will cover. But they don't cover the cost of getting you fed or helping you eat, or helping you dress, or helping you go to the bathroom, um, or making sure that you don't drift out into the street if you have serious memory problems. That's the reason why most seniors dread Alzheimer's more than they do cancer now. It's really an amazing thing. So this is the big fear. So I wanna talk about um, what Frank and Mary can do to deal with that. Well, while Frank and Mary are both alive, that's all fairly straightforward. They really don't have to worry very much because if Mary needs to go to the nursing home, she can qualify for MassHealth, which is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program as opposed to Medicare, right, um, fairly quickly. The reason for that is in order for her to qualify, and, and by the way, once she has qualified, um, then her income will go to, if, if she is in a nursing home, will go to the nursing home. Um, but all of her other expenses will be paid for by the nursing home. That's the reason why she wants to try to qualify for MassHealth as soon as possible. So Mary can qualify for MassHealth while Frank is alive fairly quickly. While she can own, she can own the home and can have up to $2,000 in countable assets, Frank could also own the home. So she could just transfer her home to Frank uh, Frank can have up to $128,640 in other cash or cash equivalent assets, and Frank can have unlimited income. So the strategy that Frank and Mary would, would, would use in this case would be that they would shift all assets to, to, from Mary to Frank if, at the time that Mary went into the nursing home. Now, once again, every senior knows that if you give away assets, and need to qualify for MassHealth, that that gift is, is subject to a five-year look-back period. 
What many seniors still don't know is that that look back period does not apply to transfers between spouses. So even though Frank and Mary owned all of their assets at the moment that Mary went into the nursing home, Mary could shift her assets to Frank and the day after she shifted them to Frank, she would no longer own the home in the case of the home and, she could, and, she, and as long as she shifted everything else out, she could meet that $2,000 asset criterion. So Mary can qualify for, 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 for Mass Health by shifting all assets to Frank. Then the question is, can Frank meet that standard? Uh, if Frank owns the home less than $128,640, $128, then Mary can qualify for Mass Health immediately. And by the way, when I'm, when I'm working with folks who are thinking about this, I always try to focus on eligibility versus the Mass Health application. Once Mary is eligible for Mass Health because these assets have been shifted, um, Mass Health will pay the nursing home retroactive to the day of her eligibility as long as she applies for Mass Health by the last day of the third month following the day of eligibility. So the thing for Mary to focus on in this situation is getting all of the assets to Frank and then getting his assets low enough. So now I want to talk about that a little bit. So the basic strategy um, is for Mary to shift, shift all assets to Frank. There's no look back. We would typically advise Frank in this case to keep, say, $100,000 of the $400,000 in assets that they have other than the house. Because remember, he can have the house um, um, because he can own the house with, and still Mary can qualify for Mass Health. Uh, I would, we would advise him to keep, say, $100,000 and to use the remaining money to buy an annuity. Um, and as long as he does that, the day after, and it's an annuity of a specific kind, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit. But the main thing is that as, as long as he does that, the day after he buys the annuity, Mary qualifies for Mass Health. Now, once she has qualified for Mass Health, her income from pension or Social Security is going to need to go to the nursing home. In this case, as we, as we uh, talked about earlier, Mary's income is only $1,000 a month. So that $1,000 a month is going to need to go to the nursing home. Mass Health is going to pay all the rest. So the only question then is, what kind of annuity does Frank need to buy um, in order to do, all, to do this? It has to be a very specific kind of annuity. And by the way, now I know I'm, I'm talking to folks, who, many of you have, will tell me, I, I don't like annuities, I don't trust annuities, annuities have a terrible rate of return, there are all kinds of problems with them. Um, in many cases, I agree with you. Uh, as a as an as a as an a asset um, as a as a profit maximizing matter as an investment matter the annuity may not be a good thing for you although that varies because there are literally a hundred different kind of annuity products that are out there they're sold by all kinds of companies I understand your concern that these things are being you know peddled to you all the time and you're not you're worried about them uh, and by the way in terms of the annuity that I'm about to talk about um, this is not an annuity that Frank needs to buy ahead of time. He can literally buy this, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, the day before Mary tries to qualify for Mass Health. So what is it about this annuity that makes it special? Um, well, first of all, um, it has to call for equal monthly payments. The payments have to be over an actuarial term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy at the time, right? Um, if Frank is 80 years old, at the point that all of this is happening, his actuarial life expectancy for mass health purposes is going to be, oh, around 10 years, a little, a little less than 10 years. And by the way, um, if Frank is looking for this annuity, he, he, he really wants to ta be talking to his elder law attorney to make sure he gets this right. Because the annuity company, if he is selling the annuity, will, it, it, and he asks the annuity company, well, what's my actuarial life expectancy? they may give him a life expectancy according to their data that is longer than what Mass Health considers to be his actuarial life expectancy. And when he goes to buy this annuity though, unless the annuity term, that is the term over which these monthly payments are being made, is shorter than Mass Health's version of his life expectancy, it's not going to be a qualifying annuity. Mary's not going to end up being able to qualify for Mass Health. So, the annuity payments have to be over Frank's actuarial life expectancy. He can't have the ability to cash it out early. 
Because if he could, then as far as Mass Health is concerned, the assets that were paid to that, uh, in, in return for that annuity or the assets that he could still surrender would still be considered to be his. That amount would then knock him over that magic number, the $128,640, which would mean that Mary couldn't qualify for Mass Health. So he can't be able to qualify, um, um, he can't be able to pull out money early. Now, he can specify that um, Peter, Paul, and Mary are going to be the death beneficiaries. Now, I'll tell you, uh, th th this is, th there is an interesting thing that's happening in Mass, or at MassHealth at this point. MassHealth um, at this point is taking the position that if Frank were to buy that annuity and Mary were to die, Mass Health should be in the, in, a, in, in the position to be the first beneficiary to get paid before the kids get any of the money. I will tell you, their position is contrary to case law in a number of jurisdictions around this country. And sooner or later, this is going to get challenged. And it may be in your particular situation, depending on what your situation is, that you may want to be challenging this. Uh, what we often advise clients uh, is that they can name Peter, Paul, and Mary as the, as the initial beneficiaries, but if that happens and Mary then, if that happens at this point, MassHealth may challenge the annuity. We feel pretty confident though that that MassHealth challenge is going to fail. Bottom line is that following Mary's death, the, the Peter, Paul, and, or excuse me, following Frank's death, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. can be the beneficiaries of this annuity. What we are sure of is that in that annuity, Frank does have to say that if he later needs to qualify for Mass Health, not Mary, but him, if he later needs to qualify for Mass Health and qualifies for Mass Health, Mass Health is going to have a, uh, a lien on these remaining payments following Frank's death for the purposes of paying Mass Health what they paid on Frank's behalf. But the main thing is that the day after Frank um, buys this annuity um, 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 with these equal monthly payments coming to him, Mary can qualify for Mass Health. So while Frank and Mary are alive, it's fairly easy for one of them to qualify for Mass Health while still protecting all of their assets. Oh, and by the way, I just want to go back to one other point on these annuities. If Frank is concerned about that, as Frank is concerned, as, as, as Frank certainly should be, that if he dies, uh, the, these remaining payments may have to go to Mass Health. Frank's way around that is to simply buy a shorter annuity so he gets his money back fast. Because as I mentioned, the annuity that is purchased by Frank, um, while it has to be shorter than his life, actuarial life expectancy, it can be much shorter. It can, instead of it being 10 years, it could be five years, it could be four years, it could be three years. If he structures things that way, then um, he'll be getting all of his money back fairly quickly. And remember, once Frank has it back, then the money's no longer subject to the mass health lien as long as Frank does the right kind of estate planning. Which leads to, what happens if Frank has died? What happens if Mary is in the nursing home and Frank then dies, and he's got these assets. Or what happens if Frank, has all, if Frank is worried that he's going to die and Mary might need nursing home care in the future? In that situation, um, Frank has a very simple strategy. And by the way, this is the typical strategy that I um, recommend to, to, senior, to, to married couples, especially if both of them are healthy is that you would, have, you would have each of them do a will that specifies that following their death, any assets that they owned would go into trust for the benefit of the surviving spouse. So in this case, where, where it is clearer who's going to the nursing home first, because Mary's already going to the nursing home, Frank's going to have a will that says that regarding any of his remaining assets, like the house, his cash, any of the remaining, any of the payments he would have gotten back from MassHealth, all of that is going to go in trust upon his death through his will for the benefit of Mary. This is not a trust that gets created at the time that Frank, while Frank is alive. It only kicks in after Frank has died. All of the assets that he was going to leave to Mary, he'll, he'll have go to in trust for Mary's benefit. You can name Peter, Paul, or Mary Jr. as the trustees. You can name anybody you want as the trustees, right? But if things are structured that way, then any assets that, that are owned by me when I die will pass through my will 
into this trust for Mary's benefit and will immediately be safe, non-countable, and non-lienable. While the assets don't have to be rearranged right now, if I'm frank, they do have to be rearranged before I die. So I'll also often tell clients if they're both healthy. So simply, you can wait. You don't have to restructure assets now. But if one of you gets sick, make sure the assets get transferred to that spouse so that before that spouse dies, the other spouse can be protected. But suppose Frank and Mary hadn't done that. And now, um, and suppose like most, most couples, they own their assets jointly. And so Frank died and then Mary became the sole owner of the assets. Now, let me tell you what Mary thinks could happen if Mary went to the nursing home the next day. Remember, these are her assets. She's got her house, she's, now she has Frank's IRA, and she has that bank account, still $800,000. Now her income has gone up to $2,000 a month from Social Security. What Mary thinks happens if she goes to the nursing home um, is that she knows the nursing home cost is going to be high. It's going to be about $12,000 a month. She knows that her income is $2,000, excuse me, or about $144,000 a year. She knows that her income is about $2,000 a year or, 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 or a month or $24,000 per year. Therefore, she realizes or she thinks that if she goes to the nursing home, she's going to be spending down, depleting her assets, burning them away at the rate of about $120,000 a year so that after five years, her assets will have evaporated down to less to $600,000. And, and there's only going to be $200,000 left for her kids. Now let me tell you what would really happen. <clears throat> if Mary needs to qualify, if Mary is in a nursing home and she needs to qualify for MassHealth and she says to the folks at MassHealth that she intends to return home, then her home will not be a countable asset. Um, if she's got these extra funds, in this case $400,000, she can actually put them into two different places. She can buy an annuity with them, very much like the annuity that Frank bought. I'm gonna to talk to you about that in a second. Uh, or she could put the money into a so-called D4C pooled trust. In either case, the day after she does those things, thereby reducing her assets to less than $2,000, she can qualify for MassHealth. Once she has qualified, um, MassHealth will require that she keep paying her $2,000 a month to the nursing home, MassHealth will pay all the rest. Now, MassHealth will have a lien on these other assets, these D the D4C asset, the D4C money, the annuity money, and the house following her death to get repaid. And so Mary would say to herself, well, in that case, what does it benefit me to do all of this other stuff? The answer is very simple. Remember, if Mary is on private pay, at, uh, at $12,000 a month or $144,000 a year, um, um, she's paying, she, that's what she's burning, her money, burning away her money. Remember, the nursing home was $14,000 a month, but her income was, was uh, $2,000, so she was costing her $12,000 a month. If she, once she's on Mass Health, however, Mass Health has a different rate for her nursing home bed, and that rate is typically around $7,000 per month. So if she's on Mass Health, she pays her, 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 her social security to the nursing home. Mass Health is going to be, is going to be paying this remaining, this, this remaining money, $7,000 a month or about $84,000 per year. Mary's new burn rate is going to be $84,000 minus her $24,000, which was, which was the, uh, the amount that she's paying to the nursing home out of her social security, or only about $60,000 per month. Mary's loss, therefore, at the end of the five years is not going to be what it was, which was $600,000. It's only going to be $300,000. Mary, at the end of those five years, will have $500,000 left to give to the kids, which is really what her goal was. Frank and Mary's goal was always to maximize the amount that was being given to the kids. So Mary has a, not only can qualify for MassHealth, she, there's a tremendous financial benefit to her children, to her to qualify for mass health. And I really want to emphasize that. As far as Mary is concerned in this case, if she needs nursing home care, she's not going to be affected one way or the other by any of this planning. She's going to be on, in a good nursing home. All nursing homes take mass health. Whether she's on private pay or on mass health, she's going to be in that same nursing home bed in the nursing home. The question is, does Mary want to restructure her assets so that most of her assets after she dies goes to go to her kids 
as opposed to having gone to the nursing home while she was alive. That's really the trade-off that we're talking about when, we're when I'm talking about these, this, these strategies. So, there are two things that Mary can do. One, she can put her money into a so-called D4C pooled trust. What in the world is a D4C pooled trust? So, if you want to learn about these, you should really just Google the term pooled trust uh, or Google um, the, any one of the, the existing pooled trusts. If you Google the term pooled trust, n most of these names will appear. I'll tell you that we use Plan of Massachusetts and, Ro Plan of Massachusetts and Rhode Island a lot. That's the one that's right on the, on the, uh, on the bottom. Um, it, it, when, we're, when we're dealing with these things, because Plan of Massachusetts is located close by, it's located uh, right on Route 128. But the concept behind all of these pool trusts is the same. Um, basically, you take assets that you, that you own, you transfer them to the managers of this pool trust. All pool trusts are managed by nonprofit organizations who work for the benefit of elderly and disabled people. You transfer all the assets to the pool trust. The folks at the pool trust then invest, invest this money for you on your behalf. They're like money managers. Um, they, they'll, they'll charge 1% per year for that investment, which is actually approximately the same that a money manager would charge you for giving you advice regarding the management of your money and actually managing it for you. The money while you're alive can be used in any way that would benefit you. Um, following your death, whatever money is left, the en entity that is the pool trust has the, has the, the right to, to a percentage of that money to keep it. That percentage tends to run between 10 and 20%, depending on how long the money has been in there. But remember, their lien is only on the remaining money, so that if all the money has been used for Mary's benefit while she was alive, so that there's nothing left, well, then the, 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 the pool trust entity gets nothing. Finally, after the pool trust has paid itself, MassHealth has a lien on the remaining money. So that to the extent that a lien has accrued during Mary's lifetime, MassHealth would have a right, have a lien on that money in order to get it back. So, um, and so typically the cost of these things are about $750 to $2,000 in an application fee. As I mentioned to you, they typically charge about 1% as a, uh, as a uh, management fee. And then at the end, there's really a, a big range. They ch they'll charge between 5 and 25% of the remaining money, typically depending on how long they've been holding the money. The use of the funds. These funds in the D4C can be used in any way that could benefit Mary. If, for example, Mary needs, more fi needs physical therapy. MassHealth typically does not pay for physical therapy services. They'll pay for the general services in the nursing home of feeding Mary and, and you know, making sure that she's, she, you know, she can use the, she's the bathrooms and showering and things, but not physical therapy. It has been my experience that many, many seniors can really benefit from just that kind of physical therapy. So, but, and the D4C can pay for that. Suppose you're going to visit Mary once a day, once a week. Suppose she's not crazy about the food here, a very common situation in a nursing home. And so you want to have food catered in. You can do that. It can all be paid for through this. Suppose she needs better equipment. Suppose she needs a better, a better wheelchair, better furniture in her room. Or remember, she still owns her house in the scenario we're giving you. So suppose there are bills for the house, like insurance or taxes. Remember, all of her income after Ma Mary has qualified for Mass Health has to go to the nursing home. The D4C can be used to pay all of those expenses. So the bottom line is that D4C can be a handy device. What about annuities? We already talked about annuities a little bit. The annuity in this case would need to be irrevocable and unamendable so that Mary couldn't get the money back um, in, in a lump sum, because if she could, it would still be an asset of hers. It has to call for equal monthly payments, which have to start no, less than, no, no more than 60 days after she's bought the annuity. The term has to be um, uh, for a period of shorter than her actuarial life expectancy. If Mary were 80 years old, for example, her life expectancy would be 10.1 years, and Mass Health would have a lien on the remaining money. The interest rate on these annuities, by the way, is terrible. Right now, it's about 1%. You would never buy one of these annuities if you were doing it as an investment matter. As a matter of fact, if you call an insurance company and say you're interested in one of these annuities and you start describing it, they'll say to you, oh, you mean a Medicaid qualifying annuity? 
The only reason why you buy these annuities is to qualify for Medicaid. The point is, uh, if you, once, once you've met those criteria, the money that has been paid to the annuity is no longer counted as one of Mary's assets. Now, um, so one, now, once the annuity has been paid for, the payments that are coming in are part of Mary's income. So they're going to get added to Mary's income, the, the amount that's being paid to the nursing home. So now, given those two tools, let's toss, talk about strategies. Well, one strategy would be Mary could purchase an annuity. Um, remember, she's got $300,000. Uh, suppose she purchased an annuity for five years. Uh, at, uh, th that annuity will pay her back approximately, assuming very lo little interest, $5,000 per year during those five years. And suppose she takes the remaining $100,000, remember she had a total of $400,000, and, and, and uses it to buy a, the, uh, and puts it into the D4C. She then keeps the house, and the, and the D4C money is used to maintain the house. If Mary dies after five years, there is no mass health lien. Because remember, the amount that mass health was, is charging as a lien is the difference between what Mary is paying from her income to the nursing home and what the, what the nursing home rate is at the mass health rate. In this case, the mass health rate is $7,000 per month. Mass, if Mary's got a, 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 uh, an annuity that is paying, that is paying $5,000 a month and her income pays $2,000 a month, she's actually paying all $7,000 a month every month. At the end of those five years, that means MassHealth has no lien um, because, because MassHealth hasn't had to pay anything during those five years. So Mary basically, Mary's house basically ends up, being, ends up being totally safe. And there are some remaining funds in the D4C and they're going to be safe too. So the bottom line here is that, that, you've, that Mary has these two, I want to say they're easy strategies but they are both strategies that she can execute in order to deal with qualifying for mass health. She can keep her house. All she has to do is say that she intends to return home and she's going to be able to keep it. She can put money into the D4C and that money can be used to pay for that house. And then she can purchase an annuity. And as long as the annuity payments plus the, the, her income end up equaling less than the cost of the nursing home bed at the mass health rate, she effectively ends up saving a huge chunk of her money. So the goal of the exercise here, of course, is to sleep well at night and to make sure that, you, you, that things are structured so that you can feel like you're safe. But if you, if you run into this situation, and many, many people do, where where one spouse has, it needs nursing home care and the other spouse is like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Or one spouse is dead and the other one needs nursing home care and the kids are saying the same thing, oh my God, what am I going to do? The answer to that question is don't assume that you need to be paying, just paying the money, all of the money to the nursing home. Go talk to somebody and figure out a strategy. It's going to help you and it's going to help your kids. Thank you very much.